Welcome back, everybody. Today, we're doing a deep dive into um, autoimmune glial fibrillary acidic protein, meningoencephalomyelitis. Wow, that's a mouthful. It is. Yeah. It is. But we can just call it uh, autoimmune GFAP astrocytopathy for short. Much easier on the tongue. Right. GFAP itself, though, is a protein that forms the backbone of astrocytes. And those are those critical support cells in the brain. They really are the unsung heroes of the nervous system. Totally. And our mission today is to really understand how this newly recognized autoimmune disease uh, works, how it shows up in patients, and uh, what researchers are uncovering about its different forms. It really is a fascinating area of research with so much we're still learning. Yeah, and to help us through all this complexity, we have with us an expert. Happy to be here. Who can shed some light on all these details and provide some valuable context. I'll do my best. Right. So the research we're looking at today is especially interesting because it dives into 11 human cases. Oh, 11. That's a good sample size for such a rare condition. Yeah. Two autopsies and nine biopsies, along with a canine autopsy. A canine case? That's unusual, but so valuable for comparative purposes. Definitely. Each case offers unique clues, kind of like uh, puzzle pieces, to help us paint a clearer picture of this disease. I like that analogy, the puzzle pieces of the brain. Right. And what really struck me was the finding of two distinct inflammatory phenotypes. Ah, yes. The lymphocytic and granulomatous presentations. Exactly. Can you walk us through what those mean and how they actually show up in this disease? Of course. So first off, it's important to remember that this disease is relatively new to medicine. You know, it's diagnosed by finding anti-GFA autoantibodies in a patient's cerebrospinal fluid. So we're talking about the body's own immune system attacking these astrocytes. That's the gist of it. And in the lymphocytic phenotype, as the name suggests, we see a significant presence of lymphocytes. Which are a type of white blood cell, right? Exactly. And they're found in the brain and spinal cord. Got it. An autopsy case, hashtag one from the study, really illustrates this beautifully, right? It involved a 75-year-old woman who sadly didn't respond to initial treatments. Yes, that case was particularly tragic. Her initial presentation was with hallucinations, but her condition deteriorated rapidly. It progressed to fever, disorientation, and severe headaches. Unfortunately, yes. And despite all efforts, she passed away. Post-mortem analysis then revealed widespread lymphocytic infiltration, especially in the basal ganglia and brainstem. So those are key areas deep within the brain responsible for movement control and essential life functions. Precisely. And those areas were heavily impacted by this immune attack. The study includes figure one, which really captures this. Mm. Could you maybe guide us through the visual details for those listening who might be following along? Of course. So figure one shows these dense clusters of lymphocytes surrounding the blood vessels. Forming what are called perivascular cuffs. Yes. You can see these lymphocytes actually infiltrating the brain tissue itself. It's quite striking. And one thing that stood out to me was a prominent deposition of C4 on the astrocytes. Ah, yes. The complement system. Now that's where things get really interesting. For those who might not be familiar, C4 is a complement protein and it's part of the body's immune response. Right, it's a powerful weapon the immune system uses to fight off invaders. Uh, but in this case, it seems to be turning against the brain itself. Right. What's really intriguing is that its role here is a bit of a mystery. Absolutely. It begs the question, is this C4D deposition a cause or a consequence of the astrocytic reactivity we're seeing in this disease? That is a great question. And I think it's one that researchers are still trying to figure out. It's definitely a hot topic in the field. All right, so let's switch gears now and look at autopsy case, hashtag two, which is a really great example of the granulomatous phenotype. This case was fascinating. It involved a 54-year-old woman who presented with progressive weakness, back pain, vertigo, and cognitive decline. It's a very different picture from the first case we discussed. It is, and she also had really severe vision and hearing loss. Along with optic disc swelling. Yes. It was quite severe. What distinguishes this case is the presence of granulomas. And those are like nodular inflammatory lesions, right? <laughs> That's a great way to put it. They were scattered throughout her brain and spinal cord. Packed with immune cells, particularly T lymphocytes. Yes, it was a very different type of immune response compared to the lymphocytic presentation. The study provides a really great visual comparison in figure four. Oh yes, figure four is a must see for anyone who wants to really grasp the differences between the two phenotypes. But the question is, why do these differences exist? Is it just random chance or is something else going on? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? It is. And researchers are currently looking into whether these distinct phenotypes 
actually represent different stages of the disease. Or if they're driven by individual patient factors. Like you said, there are so many variables at play. It's a complex puzzle, and we're only just beginning to put the pieces together. But that's what makes this research so exciting. We're on the frontier of understanding this disease. Okay, so let's move on to the biopsy cases now. Ugh. You mentioned that most of them supported that lymphocytic presentation. Yes, they did. And one consistent finding was the upregulation of MHC class I on the astrocytes. Now, MHC class I is involved in presenting antigens to the immune system, right? Exactly. And this finding suggests that cytotoxic T cells, which are specialized immune cells, are directly targeting and attacking those astrocytes. So it's like the astrocytes are being flagged as enemies. In a way, yes. And this offers a really important clue to how the disease might be working at a cellular level. And to further support this theory, they found granzyme and perforin expressing CD8 plus T cells near the astrocytes in those biopsies. Yes, and you can actually see this in figure seven. Those are the weapons that cytotoxic T cells use to eliminate their targets. It's like they're armed and ready to take out the astrocytes. Exactly, and their presence so close to the astrocytes really paints a picture of the immune system going haywire and turning against those vital support cells in the brain. It's a bit alarming, to yeah. be honest, but here's a curious observation. Despite this immune attack, there wasn't significant astrocytic death in the human cases. Right. That is interesting. You'd think with all that firepower, we'd see widespread cell death. But we don't. So what's going on there? Well, astrocytes are incredibly resilient. They have this remarkable capacity for regeneration. It's like a forest that can regrow after a fire. I love that analogy. It's very fitting. And the presence of Chi-67 positive astrocytes, which is a marker of cell proliferation, supports this idea. So they're actively replicating and compensating for the damage. Exactly. They're fighting back, which is encouraging. It's got a microscopic battle going on in the brain. And thankfully, in these cases, the astrocytes seem to be holding their own. All right, so let's shift our focus now to the canine case that was included in this study. Ah, uh, yes, the Shih Tzu. Yes, a five-year-old Shih Tzu who experienced a really rapid disease progression, which is a stark contrast to what we saw in the human cases. It was a very aggressive disease course, unfortunately, and the findings were quite different from the human cases, too. Okay, so what did they find? Well, in this dog, they saw marked astrocytic damage and a clear loss of GFA and AQP4, which is another crucial astrocyte protein. So the damage was much more pronounced in the canine case. It was. And it suggests that we might be seeing a very early stage of the disease in this dog. Before those astrocytes have a chance to regenerate and mask the damage. Exactly. It's like catching the disease in action during its most destructive phase. That's a really interesting way to think about it. It's like a snapshot of the disease's early stages. And it highlights the importance of considering the disease's timeline. You right. know how the disease progresses over time and how that can influence what we see in the brain tissue. That makes a lot of sense. And adding another layer of complexity, some cases, like autopsy case hashtag 2, showed involvement of the peripheral nervous system, with the trigeminal nerve being affected. That's a really intriguing observation, especially because GFAP isn't as prominent in the peripheral nervous system as it is in the central nervous system. Right. It's primarily found in the brain and spinal cord. Exactly. But this finding suggests that even low-level GFP expression might be enough to trigger an immune response. So the immune system is really keyed in on this protein wherever it finds it. It seems that way. Mm -hmm. And it broadens the potential scope of this disease, showing that it can affect areas beyond the brain and spinal cord. So to recap our key takeaways, autoimmune GFAP astrocytopathy can present in a lot of different ways with both lymphocytic and granulomatous phenotypes. And the evidence points to a T-cell mediated attack on those astrocytes, those vital support cells. We're also seeing complement activation with C4 deposition, but its exact role is still a bit of a mystery. A mystery we're working hard to solve. And that canine case gives us a possible glimpse into the very early stages of this disease potentially before the astrocyte regeneration kicks in. It's a valuable piece of the puzzle and one that we need to keep exploring. Now let's move on and take a closer look at those biopsy cases. Sounds good. I'm eager to see what they reveal. Me too. So those biopsy cases, while they mostly back up that lymphocytic presentation, they do offer some interesting details. Oh, like what? One thing that really stood out was the range in disease duration before the biopsy. Okay, so how long are we talking? Anywhere from just three months to 13 years. 13 years. Wow, that really highlights how different this disease can be from person to person. It really does. 
And while they didn't find a direct correlation between the disease duration and the ratio of CD4 plus to CD8 plus T cells. Those are the helper and cytotoxic T cells, right? You got it. But their presence, even in cases that had been going on for a long time, suggests the immune system is still in attack mode even after years. So even after all that time, the immune system is still targeting those astrocytes. Mm -hmm. It's kind of scary. It is a little concerning. But there was minimal axonal damage observed, which is good news. Because those axons are the long nerve cell projections that carry electrical impulses. Exactly. And keeping those intact is super important for normal brain function. Definitely. And thankfully, there were no signs of demyelination either. Meaning the protective myelin sheath around those axons was still in good shape. That's definitely a relief. So it seems like the damage is mostly limited to those astrocytes themselves, at least in these biopsy cases. That's what it looks like. Now, I'm curious about the complement system. You mentioned earlier that its role is still being investigated. Did these biopsy cases offer any more clues? Well, they specifically looked for C40 deposition in four of the biopsy cases. And remember, that's that complement protein we talked about earlier. Right. And two of those cases showed a pattern similar to autopsy case, hashtag one, with strong labeling along those astrocyte membranes and processes. But no sign of C9neo, right? Nope, none. They didn't find any evidence of that other complement protein deposited on those astrocytes. So the complement system is definitely playing a role here, but we still don't have the full picture. It's a complex system, and we're still piecing together how it all fits in. This just goes to show how much we still don't know about this disease. It's true, but that's what makes it so fascinating to study. Okay, so we've covered a lot about lymphocytic infiltrates, granulomas, cytotoxic T cells, and this whole mysterious complement system. It's been quite a journey. It has. But I think there's one more piece of this puzzle we need to revisit. The astrocytic reaction itself. Ah, yes. Those resilient astrocytes. Exactly. We talked about how well they regenerate, but how else are they responding to this whole immune system attack? Well, in all of the biopsies, the astrocytes were hypertrophic. Meaning? They were bigger, more prominent, especially at the sites of inflammation and in the surrounding areas. So they're basically bulking up to fight back. You could say that they're not just sitting there taking the hits. They're actively trying to defend themselves. That's pretty amazing. And is there any evidence that they're actually changing how they function, like adapting to this inflammatory environment? That's a great question. The researchers looked at the expression of two key aquaporin proteins, AQP1 and AQP4. And those are like water channels, right? They regulate water movement in the brain. Exactly. And they found some interesting changes in these aquaporins compared to normal brain tissue. Okay, what kind of changes are we talking about? Well, in some cases, they saw increased AQP1 expression in the cortex. That's the outer layer of the brain, right? Yep. But in other cases, there was a decrease in AQP4, especially near blood vessels and in the subforinal region. And that's the area right under the outermost layer of the meninges, those membranes that cover the brain. Right. So these changes probably reflect how those astrocytes are adapting to the stress and inflammation, trying to maintain balance in that brain fluid environment. It's like they're adjusting their internal plumbing to handle the attack. That's a good way to put it. But these changes in aquaporin expression could have pretty serious consequences for brain function, couldn't they? Definitely. Astrocytes are super important for maintaining the blood-brain barrier, regulating synaptic transmission, and providing metabolic support to those neurons. So any disruption in their function, including those changes in aquaporin expression, could have wide-ranging effects. And the fact that these changes were different in different cases really highlights just how varied this disease can be. It does. And it underscores the need for personalized medicine, finding treatments that are tailored to each individual patient. So taking a step back for a second, this research really emphasizes how crucial astrocytes are for a healthy brain. They really are. For a long time, we thought they were just passive bystanders, but now we're realizing just how dynamic and essential they are. They're not just the scaffolding. They're active participants in almost everything the brain does. And the more we learn about their role in health and disease, the more opportunities we'll have for developing new treatments. And this research on autoimmune GF8 astrocytopathy is a perfect example of that. It really is. It shows how understanding the complexities of astrocyte biology can lead to major breakthroughs in diagnosing and treating these neurological disorders. It's a powerful reminder that even the tiniest cells can have a huge impact on our health and well-being. Couldn't agree more. It really feels like we're finally giving astrocytes their due 
you know, and I have a feeling this is just the tip of the iceberg. I agree. There's so much more to discover about these fascinating cells and how they impact both a healthy and diseased brain. Definitely. Before we wrap up this deep dive, I wanted to circle back to that canine case. It offered some really valuable insights into the early stages of the disease, but did they find any clues as to why this particular dog had such a rapid and aggressive disease course? That's a good question, and unfortunately, the research doesn't give us a definite answer. It's possible that genetic factors played a role. You know, certain dog breeds, like pugs and shisus, are known to be prone to developing a type of necrotizing meningoencephalitis. And that shares some similarities with autoimmune GFEPA astrocytopathy in humans. Exactly. So there might be a genetic susceptibility that makes these breeds more vulnerable to this kind of immune attack on the brain. So it's like they're predisposed to having their immune systems turn against their own brain cells. In a way, yes. And it's worth noting that in this canine case, the inflammation wasn't limited to the brain. They also found inflammation in the meninges. Those are the membranes that surround the brain and spinal cord. Yeah. Right? Which suggests a more widespread immune activation that could explain why the disease progressed so rapidly. So it wasn't just localized to one specific area. It was more like a system-wide attack. Exactly. It really underscores how these autoimmune diseases can affect multiple parts of the nervous system, not just the brain itself. And that highlights the need to look at the whole picture when diagnosing and treating these conditions. Absolutely. We can't just focus on one area. We need to consider all the possible factors. We've covered a lot of really technical details today, but it's important to remember that behind all those details are real people and their families. That's so important. It's easy to get caught up in the science, but at the end of the day, it's all about helping people. Exactly. And this research gives us hope that someday we'll be able to diagnose autoimmune diseases like GFUP astrocytopathy earlier, treat them more effectively, and maybe even prevent them altogether. I share that hope. And I believe that with more research and collaboration, we can make that a reality. Well, I think we've successfully navigated this complex topic and given everyone a good foundation for understanding autoimmune GFE astrocytopathy. A huge thank you to Expert Speaker for sharing your expertise and insights. It was my pleasure. I always enjoy diving into these fascinating areas of neurology. And to everyone listening, if you have any questions or want to learn more, please don't hesitate to reach out. We're always here to guide you through the world of neuroscience. From Vet Neurojar, keep those minds inspired, hearts light, and tails wagging.